And good morning, folks. Please be seated. Good morning, Council. And Mr. O'Toole, if you could uh, give me the honor of doing the uh, caption, sir. Absolutely. Thank you. This is the matter of the state of Washington versus Joseph McEnroe. Case number is 0710871 6 4 Seattle. Mr. McEnroe is present this morning in court with his counsel. My name is Scott O'Toole, and along with Michelle Morales, we appear on behalf of the state. We are here for purposes of sentencing. Thank you. Right, thank
Thank you, and good morning again. And let me ask Mr. Presti and Mr. Omaji, are you prepared to proceed this morning? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, so, Mr. O'Toole, um, I know much of this is uh, preordained, but could you give me the state's recommendation and let me know if there are any individuals who wish to make any presentations to the court at this point in time? Your Honor, does the court prefer that uh, the parties address you from the tables or from the lower bench? In light of the number of uh, individuals involved in this and the media, I think probably at council table would be best just to make it a little easier to follow the proceedings. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Your Honor, for purposes of the record, as the court well knows, on March 25th, 2015, the defendant was uh, convicted by a jury trial of six counts of aggravated murder in the first degree. With each of those counts, the jury found and answered positively the question of whether he was armed with a firearm in the commission of each of those crimes. The defendant's sentence for each of those crimes, counts one through six, aggravated murder in the first degree, is life in prison without the possibility of parole or release. Uh, that is, of course, the state's recommendation at this time. I would indicate to the court that um, I'm aware that uh, Pam Mantle and Tony Mantle would like to address the court at the appropriate time. Mary Victoria Anderson has um, uh, indicated uh, that she will be here this morning. She's not here yet, and she may want to address the court uh, at that time. I'll check with her when she arrives. You know, Your Honor, I also received uh, word this morning that um, one or, or more of the jurors would like the opportunity to address the family at an appropriate time to report the uh, report to agree to that. Uh, thank you. And, and they wish to address them in the uh, course of the sentencing proceedings? Yes, sir. Okay, certainly. And I should also note for the record that I received uh, victim impact letters uh, from Julie Clanky, I think it's pronounced, uh, Ken Anderson, and Linda Anderson as well. Thank you. Okay. So, Council, if you'd like to go ahead and um, call forward those individuals who wish to make presentation, feel free to do so. I can have... Uh, Mr. Governor? Yes, Ms. Ross. We do not believe it's appropriate for jurors to address the family within, within this vehicle. They're perfectly entitled to do that privately at the prosecutor's office. Uh, they are not among the um, category of people under the state constitutional amendment that are allowed to address the court at sentencing. So we think it should be limited to that category of people. Um, well, let me ask you this, Ms. Ross. In light of the fact that the court has virtually no discretion at the sentencing proceeding, what would be the prejudice that would be experienced by your client, either actual or theoretical? I don't think it's necessarily to Mr. McEnroe that prejudice would fall because his sentence is preordained, but uh, judging from comments of some jurors in the uh, media, uh, I think that it could be uh, very offensive to other jurors who may or may not be here. I think it could even be uh, uh, prejudicial to uh, Ms. Anderson because uh, her jurors are still out in the uh, media, uh, are out in the public that may be watching uh, these proceedings on television. All right, thank you, Ms. Ross. On late of the objection, Mr. O'Toole, do you wish to uh, respond at all? I will briefly, Your Honor. I think the question that you asked counsel was, what would be the prejudice to her client? Right. The answer that she provided to you did not address that question. There is no prejudice to her client. Rather, there is a, apparently a theoretical claim of prejudice somehow to jurors who are not here uh, regarding statements that Ms. Ross has not yet heard. And with respect to Ms. Anderson, who, if memory serves, is not Ms. Ross's client. There is no prejudice to Mr. McEnroe at all. We have heard the court include this in the court's discussion. And, and not knowing which jurors are present and um, what their position may have been at the time of the deliberations, I have no idea what their message might be to the family, but I'm going to permit them to give that message. So so go ahead, Mr. O'Toole, with your witnesses. So what I will do is ask uh, anyone who would like to speak to come stand next to me or address the court. Yes. Okay, that's this. No, that's okay. Thank you for asking. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Tony Mantle will address the court first. I'll ask him to identify himself for the court. Uh, Mr. Mantle, why don't you step on over here okay. so that the, the, the uh, video can pick you up. So go right ahead, sir. Uh, my name is Tony Mantle, and prior to giving my statement, I would like to say 
I find it unbelievably disrespectful that this man, convicted of six counts of first-degree murder, is allowed in this courtroom without chains and prison attire. Whoever made that decision should be ashamed of themselves. Okay, anything further, sir? Well, the last couple months, the defense has introduced Joseph McEnroe as a misunderstood man who is the product of a bad upbringing. Somebody who can't even control his motor functions. Yet yeah, I know a different Joseph McEnroe, a highly functioning, arrogant Mr. McEnroe. He was not some entranced automaton when he committed these murders. He was rocking and rolling. He did this out of sport and out of greed. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Mantle. I'm sorry. Sir, Your Honor, this is uh, Pamela Mantle. I'll ask her to introduce herself to the court. Certainly. I'm uh, Pamela Mantle, Erica Mantle's mother, Olivia and Nathan's grandmother, Scott Russell Anderson's mother in law, and friend of Judy and Wayne Anderson. And I had brought along pictures of my children. This is all my children. They graduated. These are all their graduation pictures. There's Sarah Anderson that worked with Joseph McEnroe at Target and knew him well. Joseph was a welcomed part of our family. Um, I don't know what happened. I do know that my daughter would be very, very upset that Joseph murdered her children and her mother-in-law and her father-in-law, her husband, and he shot my daughter six times. And I had a big, long speech that I was going to tell you about. I want to thank whoever put the six carnations on the bench. I don't know who that was. It was very um, kind and touching. And I just want to say, Joe, you know and I know that no matter what kind of a childhood you had and what kind of parent raised you, and I believe in my heart that your mother raised you well. I wasn't fooled by any of the bullshit that was said about your mom during the trial. I think she was probably an overwhelmed lady with a bunch of kids trying to find her way in the world. But there's no excuse for what you did to Erica. She begged for her life and you shot her six times. She was a little bitty girl and you shot my little granddaughter twice. You shot Nathan. You wiped everybody out and I'm just, I'm really sad and you have ruined Sarah's life to the point where she can hardly function and you have ruined my heart by doing this. The one survivor out of this is my son, Joe Mantle, who in the face of going through a murder trial, his, his family going through a murder trial during his senior year of high school, which I'm sure you never even thought about seven and a half years ago. He won scholarships and he won the respect of every person that knows him. And he overcame what you did to his family. And I just hope you're really happy with yourself, Joe. I have just a moment. Certainly.
Your Honor, uh, for the record, Mary Victoria Anderson is now in court, and um, she uh, has asked somebody to speak on her behalf, so I'll ask you to introduce yourself to the court, first and last name. Uh, Richard Dunn Calf. Thank you, sir. And whatever you want to say. Yeah, we just decided two minutes ago that I would speak for her. Okay. So, I got to, you know. That's all right. Take your time. <laughs> so. I've known uh, Victoria for five and a half years. So I know what she's gone through. She doesn't function as a normal person anymore. She can't. And I don't think most people realize taking a shower is a, a big deal. Uh, I could get into a lot of things, but like I said, I was just asked to do this, so it's coming right now. So, and her uh, 17 year old son, who was about nine and a half at the time, he's totally destroyed. Totally. And uh, I've talked to people in the last uh, couple months. Yeah, there's hardly anybody to even know about this. I, I said, you know about the Anderson? No, I don't know. And they've lived here all their life. What about the people that's moved here in the last seven, eight years? And uh, like I said, um, there's no way Victoria could have spoke. And, uh, I've seen enough of this trial. To, um, it's disgusting what happened. A person that would do that on Christmas Eve has got to be about as low as a form as you can be. People totally vulnerable. Supposed to be the best part of the year. Families get together. It's all about love and family. And I can't imagine it. It's unthinkable what this person did. And as far as I'm concerned, he's pathetic, despicable, and yeah, sometimes it's anyway. And he's not even a good actor. Not even a good actor. And I was going to say something else, but I, I'm not going to say what I really think of him. But he has destroyed so many lives. They'll never be the same. But we all got to move on. And to take eight and a half years, is that correct? Seven. Seven and a half. There's a long time to wait for closure. And I don't know if they'll ever have closure. And this is something that none of us would ever want to be in a position. And uh, who would ever imagine something like this? Yeah. Totally unthinkable to do that on Christmas Eve. And Father's Day is coming up. And Mother's Day is, And Easter's. And birthdays. They'll never be the same. No. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. my son, Ryan Baker. Uh, Ryan lost his 
best friend and his best friend's wife and his two godchildren. Um, it's left a big hole in his heart. He's a different person today than he was before this happened. Um, I had heard about it on the radio and I called him as soon as I could because I didn't want him to hear about it on the radio and so um, I had to talk to him on the phone about it so that he wouldn't just hear about his best friend. Um, it's been really hard for him and uh, I've been here for support and um, I just wanted to say that uh, I, I hope that McEnroe goes to prison and we don't ever have to hear about him again. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. My name is Angela Morello Williams. I was the presiding juror. I speak not for all of the jurors, you're right, Ms. Ross, but I do speak for a majority of them. And we owe an apology to the family. We owe the apology to the family for having your rights trampled on, for having this gone on for eight years of having to relive countless times over and over and over again. There are victims' rights, and one of those rights is the right to a fair and speedy trial. And you have the right to justice. And that, if eight and a half years is, is a short period of time, we're ever so sorry for that. Because most of the time, it seems like a capital punishment case takes between two and a half and three years, which is long enough. And you still have more coming down the line. And for I have no words. We were introduced into your family in the most horrific way that we could possibly be introduced. We saw intimate details of your family that none of us should ever have seen. And for that, we're sorry. We're sorry that when we went back to deliberate in, a, in the second phase of the trial that it ended up in jury nullification. Your justice was not done in the fair and right way that the, the justice sets out to do. We're sorry that in the scheme of things that you, you have to relive this over and over and over again. We're sorry that in a, court, in a courtroom and a justice, political vehicles overwhelmed the voices of the victims that were crying out so loud to be heard. Politics is one thing. Politics equate to power. Justice is equality and honesty and fairness for all. And despite what some of the contrary belief is, we were picked out of 3,000 people to be the conscious of conscience of this, of society and to rule on this and put aside our personal feelings and our religious feelings. And we're ever so sorry that that didn't happen. But I want, we all want you to know that you have touched our lives by how courageous, how steadfast, how wonderfully you have held yourself up, how you have stood the ground, how you have never wavered, how when your day for justice came, you didn't have sour grapes, you didn't turn bitter, you didn't do any of those things. It shows the true love that you have for your family. And we all want you to know that Wayne, Judy, Scott, Erica, Nathan, and Olivia will always be in our hearts, and you have touched us deeply. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Anyone else would like to address the court? I mean, if I might have just a moment. Yeah, please.
know that Judge Ramsell has met you before, but I'll ask you for the record to introduce yourself again. And then to, uh, to tell the judge what you'd like him to hear. Oh, Mary Victoria Anderson. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I just want to know that uh, we loved him very much. My mom and dad loved him. My brother loved him. Everybody. He was our family. Um, and, and I do know uh, he was going to kill me and my kids as well. And I never did anything to him. Uh, none of us did. I, I still wonder, when did he realize that my family weren't this horrible person that my sister had, um, had I guess, made him believe. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's about it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Cool, anything further, sir? I don't believe so, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. And counsel, um, are there any individuals you wish to call, or does Mr. McEnroe wish to exercise his right to allocution? I know he testified at the penalty phase, and he also allocated, but um, if he wishes to say anything at this time, he's welcome to. No, Your Honor. <clears throat> Mr. McEnroe has no further statements, and the defense has no further presentation of witnesses. I do want to correct any misconceptions that this was a jury nullification. As far as we can determine, the decision was based on the personal moral judgment of the jurors, which is exactly what the law calls for. Thank you. And Mr. Prestia, with regard to the uh, sentencing recommendation, as I said before, I know that much of it is a foregone conclusion. Anything you want to say about the recommendation made by the state? No, Your Honor. We think that the court should impose the only sentence that is uh, possible uh, based on the verdict. All right. Thank you. And Mr. O'Toole, just for the record, I'm going to ask you whether or not the state is going to be receive, uh, seeking any restitution in any way, shape, or form. Thank you, Your Honor. It has uh, yet to be uh, determined uh, whether we'll do that. Mr. Presley and I had a chance to speak just before we uh, began this morning. Well, I thought we'd indicate on the uh, judgment and sentence form that if there's any restitution, it would be uh, presented at a hearing at a later date. And uh, I believe Mr. Uh, Presley indicated his client would waive his presence in that regard. Okay. All correct, Your Honor. Thank you. So anything further from any of you at this point? Yeah, the only thing I would mention is along with the forms that will, that are, will be handed over to the defense, including the fingerprint form and uh, the other forms as well, there's an advisement of rights form to review. Uh, I'll also would indicate that uh, Ms. obviously Mr. McEnroe has the right to waive any right of appeal at this point, uh, having been convicted of six counts of aggravated murder, if you'd like to. Right. Thank you very much, sir. All right. So Mr. McEnroe, Behind you is an empty bench bearing six carnations and six name placards. In placing those items there, this court has borrowed loosely from the military tradition of the fallen comrade table. That empty bench and each of the six white carnations symbolize the people whose lives you have taken. Wayne, Judy, Scott, Erica, Olivia, and Nathan. Because of your actions, we're all assembled here today. Also because of your actions, those six individuals cannot physically be present and must be represented by flowers. People who don't work within the court system oftentimes think that judges, lawyers, and even jurors forget about the victims and only care about the rights of the defendant. This is not true. The victims are not forgotten and the pain and anguish experienced by their loved ones does not fall on deaf ears. None of us who have been involved in this case will ever forget the names and faces of Wayne, Judy, Scott, Erica, Olivia, or Nathan. How could we? The horrible fate that befell them should never have been visited upon any human being. For example, we will all remember Erica's courageous and selfless plea to spare her children. We will all remember Nathan's innocent attempt to placate Mr. McEnroe by handing him a telephone battery. These images and a myriad of others will remain with all of us forever. 
I can assure you that the victims have not and will not be forgotten. Fortunately for you, Mr. McEnroe, we live in a society that is committed to the principles of due process and the rule of law. You have been the beneficiary of all the protections that our legal system affords. You've been provided excellent and capable counsel. You've been provided access to the state's evidence against you. You've been provided an opportunity to conduct your own investigation. You've been provided resources for the retention of experts. You've been provided a courtroom and a judge for resolving legal disputes. And you've been provided an opportunity to present your case to a jury of 12 unbiased individuals. All of that stands in sharp contrast to the manner in which your six victims were murdered. In a matter of moments, you became their judge, jury, and executioner. They were defenseless before you as you wielded your firearm. There was no opportunity for them to save themselves, to obtain a reprieve, or to save each other. They were cowardly ambushed on Christmas Eve, a time when they expected nothing but joy and goodwill. It's no wonder that your actions have outraged the public. It's also no wonder that many members of the public were demanding that you be executed for these brutal and senseless murders. However, the law in the state of Washington presumes that the proper sentence for even the most horrific crimes is life without the possibility of release or parole. A death sentence may only be imposed if the state proves to a unanimous jury beyond a reasonable doubt that any mitigating circumstances that exist are insufficient to merit leniency. The law is written that way to reserve the death penalty for the worst of the worst offenders, despite the horrendous nature of the crime they committed. In other words, the law requires that when jurors decide whether a defendant should live or die, they must consider not only the facts of his crime, but his moral culpability as well. The verdict in this case is the result of 12 individuals who did just that. Now, contrary to what has been written by some, this was not an instance of jury nullification. During the penalty phase of the trial, the state candidly conceded that mitigating circumstances existed in this case. Indeed, the jury heard several weeks of defense witnesses who all spoke to those circumstances. They also heard from Mr. McEnroe himself. Before their deliberations began, the jury was instructed that the presumptive sentence for Mr. McEnroe's crimes is life imprisonment without the possibility of release or parole. They were also informed that the presumptive sentence could only be elevated to death if the state proved to all 12 jurors beyond a reasonable doubt that the mitigating circumstances were insufficient to merit leniency. After several days of deliberating on that question, four jurors concluded simply that the state had not met its heavy burden of proof. Consequently, though divided, the jury as a whole returned a lawful verdict imposing the presumptive sentence. All 12 jurors, each in their own way, followed the court's instructions. Their service was honorable and their collective judgment must be respected. Now, as I'm sure you know, Mr. McEnroe, I have no discretion in this matter. The jury's verdict mandates a sentence of life imprisonment without the possibility of release or parole on each of the six counts to be served consecutively. On the other hand, had all 12 jurors agreed that the state had met its burden of proof, this court would now be imposing a sentence of death, likewise as required by law. The fact that two-thirds of the jurors concluded that execution was the appropriate punishment should be a sobering thought that stays with you for the rest of your life. You have been afforded a tremendous opportunity, Mr. McEnroe. It's the opportunity to live out your life to its natural end. This is an opportunity that you denied to each one of your victims, including two children who had barely begun their life's adventure. 
You've been afforded this opportunity despite the fathomless anguish that you caused the victim's family and friends. You've been afforded this opportunity despite the harm your actions have inflicted upon countless others who have been touched by this case, including the jurors who were handed the unenviable task of deciding your fate. You've been afforded this opportunity because you live in a society governed by the rule of law, not by anger, vengeance, or vigilantism. The process has been long and arduous for everyone involved. For some, it may have seemed like this day would never arrive, but it has. Although your life has been spared, Mr. McEnroe, this court now sentences you to the harshest sentence otherwise available under the law. Life imprisonment without the possibility of release or parole on count one for the murder of Wayne Anderson. Life imprisonment without the possibility of release or parole on count two for the murder of Judy Anderson. Life imprisonment without the possibility of release or parole on count three for the murder of Scott Anderson. Life imprisonment without the possibility of release or parole on count four for the murder of Erica Anderson. Life imprisonment without the possibility of release or parole on count five for the murder of Olivia Anderson. And life imprisonment without the possibility of release or parole on count six for the murder of Nathan Anderson. With regard to uh, fees and costs, the court will impose the mandatory victim's assessment penalty, the DNA fee, waive all other non-mandatory fees and assessments pursuant to state versus Blazina, and a restitution will be set by the court within the statutory framework. Uh, Mr. O'Toole, have I left anything out, sir? You know, the only issue I might raise is there was testimony, I think, in the course of the trial that Mr. McElroy had uh, some assets uh, in the neighborhood of, I thought it was ten or twelve or fifteen thousand dollars. I don't know if that factored into your uh, determination with respect to the payment of court costs and fees. It did, counsel, but I think that would be best uh, directed towards restitution, which I do believe would be imposed. Thank you. So thank you, sir. Anything else, Mr. O'Toole? Uh, no, Your Honor, let me have this moment. Please. Okay. And counsel, um, I know we discussed this earlier, but would Mr. McEnroe waive his presence at the restitution hearing if ne what needs to be said? Yes, Your Honor. And you've discussed that with him? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Preston. Now, the defendant's total legal financial obligation is $600 uh, independent and exclusive of restitution. And I will provide a copy of the court court rules to counsel regarding the payment of that obligation. Thank you. Uh, there's also a community custody provision with respect to serious violent offenses in the event that uh, Mr. McEnroe was ever released. And there is a theoretical possibility, of course, that he would uh, someday be granted clemency or pardon. Um, that is an, on page five of the judgment and sentence. It provides for a crime committed uh, within the time range of Mr. McEnroe's crimes a uh, community custody term of 24 to 36. I will impose that with the understanding that it's unlikely to ever be effectuated. Mr. Presti, do you want to weigh in on that? It may be best to wait to determine the magnitude of the restitution amount. Certainly, Your Honor. That's what I think is best. Okay, so we will reserve on that, Mr. O'Toole. And I don't know if you mentioned this, Your Honor. I apologize if you did. I missed it. With respect to the uh, weapons enhancements, I assume you were opposing judgment on those as well. On Certainly. Those thank you. Does the court have uh, any indication in its records of credit time, sir? 
I do not. You put as, as calculated by uh, the jail. It, yeah, we'll have it calculated by the jail. I know it's significant, but I don't know what the number is. And the state uh, uh, was requesting, I can't remember if it's in our paperwork or not, that the court receive a no contact order between uh, the defendant and any member of the victim's immediate or extended family. I would certainly grant that. No objection. Would ask the counsel if, uh, if their consideration is uh, to go ahead and have Mr. McElroy waive any right of appeal at this time. Not at this time, Your Honor. He'll, he certainly is capable of making that decision within the 30 days. All right, thank you. Does the court want us to go ahead and do the fingerprints right here? Absolutely. Go right ahead, sir. show the fingerprints to Madam Clerk to make sure we got it right. Thank you.
Your Honor, I will hand up uh, the judgment and sentence uh, form that has been reviewed by the defense and I believe si been signed off by counsel and by Mr. McEnroe. I'm going to go ahead and give a, the, uh, the uh, instructions for the legal financial obligations. All right. Thank you, counsel. I've reviewed the judgment and sentence that comports with the order of the court, and I've signed it along with the fingerprint page attesting to the fact that these are indeed Mr. McEnroe's fingerprints taken in open court this morning. I've also signed Appendix G, Appendix H, and Mr. McEnroe has received his notice of rights on appeal, and he has also signed the notice of ineligibility to possess a firearm and loss of the right to vote, and he will be provided a copy of that as well. And counsel, anything further in this particular matter? Not in this eight-year-old, thank you. Mr. Prestia? No, Your Honor. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the sentencing hearing in this particular matter. To the family and friends of the victims, I hope this brings an end to at least part of the nightmare that you have experienced. Before we recess, I would ask all of you to join me in a moment of silence in remembrance of Wayne, Judy, Scott, Erica, Olivia and Nathan. Thank you all. Court is in recess. All rise. Mr. Prestia and Mr. O'Toole. Yes. Turns out we need one of these after all. Oh. It's the uh, stipulation. Well, uh, we didn't do one earlier because we need one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, I'm just trying to think. Well, this is a scene of exclusion of appeal. Well, no. It, 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 if you here, read, yeah. read that. One year. That's fine. Following any of final judgment or right. okay. okay, that's fine. All right, thank you. He's just signed. Thank you. That's all we need. It, it, that's a homage. <laughs> I've been perfecting that signature for the last seven years. That is Michelle, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Very good. Yep. yep.